I'm Dana Granholm. I'm here to introduce to you the first segment in a multi-part series following the Civil War Journal of James Grizzard, a soldier in the 38th Illinois. The journal follows his journeys from Springfield, Illinois to Perryville, Stones River, Chickamauga, and Atlanta. It ends with his return home to Indianapolis. Our research shows that from 1868 to 1882, James resided in Evansville, Indiana. He was a painter, a husband, and a father of five children. Today, his journal rests in the University of Southern Indiana Special Collections Archive. This is the University Archives and Special Collections at the University of Southern Indiana. We are located on the third floor of the David L. Rice Library. The Gazar Diary came to our collection in 1996 from the Kenneth McCutcheon family. We have transcribed copies of this available to the public and we keep it on permanent display here at the archives. When we started this project, everyone knew very little about James Grizzard, other than what he had left us in his journal. As we came to know him and his experiences, we began to wonder more and more who he was, what happened to him after the war, and how his journal survived. While I haven't yet found all the answers, we were able to piece together some interesting facts. By looking in city directories, we were able to determine he was a painter in Evansville in 1868, and his business was located on Main Street. The 1880 census revealed that his mother was born in England and his father immigrated from France. He was married to Maria and they had five children. When and where James died remains a mystery to us. Maria is listed as a widow in the 1900 census, so we know that James must have died sometime between 1880 and 1900. We're also able to follow the path of his children and their children through the Browning Obituary Index. By the time of his wife's death in 1917, she was living in McCutcheonville and is buried at a local church there. Must have rained near all night, but I had put up my doghouse and did not get wet, but was so tired I did not take care of my gun and had to take it apart to get the load out. We thought we would see fun today, but the troops began to pass us early and passed all day most. We only moved up on the side of the hill. It seemed to me that all mankind has come to this war. James Grizzard was a man among thousands in a war that saw more loss of life per population of the U.S. than any other war in the history of the country. His journal has survived nearly 15 decades to give us a glimpse of the horror that over 3 million men experienced in the four years of Civil War. After the Battle of Perryville in October of 1862, the Union forces found themselves chasing the retreating Confederates east across Kentucky. James' regiment formed part of the pursuing forces, chasing the Confederates northward as Bragg attempted to consolidate his army with General Kirby Smith's in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. The 38th found itself stopped short less than a week later due to the Confederates burning bridges behind them in Lancaster. They camped there for several days, but when word came the Confederate army was heading south to Tennessee, James's regiment was ordered west. By the first week of November, the 38th had crossed the Tennessee border, though by the same way they had come up from Tennessee months previously and not through the Cumberland Gap far to the east as the Confederates had. The 38th was essentially put in a holding pattern around Nashville as of the 16th of November. James and his regiment moved from small town to small town, fighting off the first frosts of winter as the Army of the Cumberland gathered around them. Major General Rosecrans would wait until after Christmas to move against the Confederate General Bragg's forces some 30 miles south in Murfreesboro. This was about as dry a Christmas as last year was. Some few managed to get drunk by paying for whiskey at $1.75 a pint. And this, with dress parade, was all the Christmas we had. Orders to have three days rations and haversacks and march at an early hour in the morning, December 25, 1862. They set out to march early in the morning of the 26th as they had been told they would. The 38th made it as far as Nolensville before encountering any resistance. We advanced over an open field and halted about the middle of it, and the rebels began shooting at us from a battery they had on a hill. Some of the shot would plow up the dirt round us, and every man tried to make himself as little as possible. Colonel Collin rode up and asked us to take that battery. Stepping up to the challenge, James and his company fixed bayonets and moved to take the hill. We would sink over our shoe tops in the mud every jump, 
Then we had fences to pull down and ditches to jump, the skirmishers going on ahead. After getting on the hill, we found they had taken the hint and left. They were only allowed a few moments of rest on the hill, as they quickly found that the rebels had posted on a different hill nearby. We had an open field to go through, and while going through, the shot and shell came whistling past us thick. I was running along when a man in Company C jumped before me and was shot. I came near falling over him. Two pieces of artillery fell into the hands of the Union after their successful charge, though at the cost of three killed and ten wounded. The 38th camped in Nolensville for the next two days, with the rest of Rosecrans' armies shivering with the cold and rain. On the 29th of December, they marched to within a few miles of the city. A stiff northerly wind blew in during the night. Our company went on picket and the night was very cold. There was no fires allowed in camp or on picket. Passed the most miserable night that no man could have paid me to have done if I could help myself. Night of December 29th. The next day did not bring all-out battle as many had expected. Instead, Union and Confederate forces consolidated positions, the Confederates holding a line just west of the Icy Stones River and the Union Army exactly parallel. Skirmish lines clashed with probing forces. James' regiment formed a large skirmish line with the 21st Illinois and 15th Wisconsin along the southernmost tip of the main Union Army. There we was ordered to pile up our knapsacks and prepare to go in battle. We soon were ready and advanced one mile when the first column found them, and then the roar of musketry was terrible, and the shells and balls flew thick as hail over us as we lay down flat on our bellies and made ourselves as little as possible. With dark coming on, the firing ceased, and Company B went up and fired a volley, and this ended this day's fight, but with severe loss to the 21st and 15th. There was a detail team made of ten men from each company to go back after the knapsacks, and one man from each company for guard. I was one of the lucky men for guard. The knapsacks came up, but everything was wet. I did not get sleep this night, December 30th. Confederates under General Hardy made the first attack early in the morning of the 31st. In a surprise attack against the Union's right wing, he swept all resistance aside, pushing General McCook's entire right wing more than a mile north in only a few hours. James and his regiment were situated in the center of the right wing on the morning of the 31st. Got up very numb and chilly, done up my knapsack, putting my blanket round me, and had got no breakfast when the order came to move to the left. By this time, companies F and G on picket began firing. When we moved to the left, heard heavy firing on the right and left. When the right and left gave way, we were taken aback a few yards and then advanced to the left, which was charging back and forth. We now got a foot in it, for the rebels came on us six or eight columns deep. We must have poured destruction through their ranks, for every man seemed to do his best but we could not stop them, and I looked around and saw that most of the regiment was gone. I thought it was high time I was leaving, and my legs done me good service. James's division was the last one to collapse, but when it did, whole regiments disintegrated as the fleeing Union soldiers attempted to reach the relative safety of their quickly consolidating left and middle wings. James's company had suffered heavy losses in the initial attack, so he fought with whatever Union forces he could find as he retreated. I rallied with the 21st. Our batteries now opened out on the rebels, but the order was skedaddle, and men, batteries, and ammunition wagons were going it on the double quick for the rear. We run through a cotton field and a thick clump of cedar bushes. Here the men were rallied and stood until they had fired one volley, and then cut and run again through the woods until at last we found reinforcements. And these brave men yelled, Cowards, what are you running for? And don't let them through. And everything else they could think of. They gave a yell and two volleys that sent the rebels back. They then fixed bayonets and advanced to the cedar slowly, so acted as a skirmisher for the valiant men. James stayed with this group for some time, skirmishing with the advancing Confederates, then retreating in a somewhat orderly manner, covering for some other retreating Union forces, until even this brave group couldn't withstand the Confederate onslaught. The rebels gave a yell and volley, which started these valiant men back pell-mell and every man for himself. In coming back this time, I took a little different route, and on entering the brush, I saw a place where both rebels and Union men lay thick, dead and dying. I saw one man with his brother propped up against a tree. He was shot through the breast. The brother would feel his wound and rub his face and look the very picture of despair. He asked me to get him some water, but I had not one drop and had but little time to look in the canteens that were lying around, for the rebels were close at hand, and I started off telling him to come on, but I guess he stayed and was killed or captured, for the rebel skirmishers came near getting me. 
Once James was finally behind his main lines that evening, he began to search for the remnants of his regiment, but found that only eight other men remained in his company, the others killed, missing, or wounded. Though the Union had lost large amounts of land over the course of the day, their position had been heavily solidified by nightfall, due to the fact that the entire army had never been completely broken, and that the right wing had managed to retreat in somewhat of an orderly fashion. Rather than pressing their attack into the early evening on the 31st, the Confederates dug in around the Union position, settling in for a restful New Year's Day. After getting our works done, we waited anxiously for the rebels to come. They did, but not to us. They went to Sheridan's division and were mowed down by the hundreds and were soon put on the back track. James witnessed one of only two probes launched against the Union lines on the first. The other had been against Thomas in the new center of the Union line and had been just as unsuccessful. On the second, Bragg launched an offensive against the Union left wing, which, after initial success, was repulsed by the rapidly reinforced Union line and intense artillery fire. About 1 p.m., we heard heavy firing on the left, accompanied by loud yelling, and we were soon formed in line and started on the double quick for the left. On the route, we had to wade Stone River, the water over knee deep, and the mud on the other bank as deep. After forming and reforming, we finally halted about dark in a neck of woods. All this time, they were fighting like devils on our right and must have been killing thousands, if a person's to judge by the noise. That night passed miserably, as did the next. I went to bed having a woolen blanket and oil blanket to sleep under. It rained hard all night. The other men piled on us, and here we slept, six or eight, one on top of the other. Myself and partner being under slept very well, but I could feel them shudder and shake with cold and water. Night of January 3rd. General Bragg, under the assumption that Rosecrans would continue to receive munitions and reinforcement by way of supply train, felt he had to retreat. At 10 p.m. January 3rd, the Confederate Army marched almost 40 miles to the south to Tullahoma. James gratefully took the next few days to rest and recover with the rest of his regiment. On the 5th, he, along with men from the 21st Illinois, took orders to bury the dead. We dug a long trench and there was 26 of our men buried here from the regiment. I do not know what the loss is. After getting the work done, we fired three volleys over the graves and departed. And by this time, it was near dark, and we had no time to go over the field. But I had saw enough. The total casualties for the Union topped 13,000 men, with the Confederates losing 10,000 of their own. It would have the highest percentage casualty rate of any major battle in the Civil War. Though the numbers don't reflect it, the battle was a strategic Union victory as it raised morale for the whole Union and solidified the Union's hold of Middle Tennessee. James Grizzard would go on to fight in Tullahoma, Chickamauga, and Atlanta. He mustered out in September of 1864 in Louisville, Kentucky. I lost my transportation and had to pay my way home, which was to Indianapolis, where we found everything full at the hotels. But we found rest for the night in the hall of the commercial hotel, and then went to the theater and enjoyed ourselves like men again. I now being home, this ends the story. September 21st, 1864.